I don't hear any noise. Hello, and thank you all for joining us. Um, if you could maintain yourself on mute, that would be great for the duration of the presentation. My name is Christian Jorgensen, and I'm an IHL legal advisor for the American Red Cross National Headquarters located in Washington, DC. The American Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program works to educate the public on the principles and basis of IHL through the efforts of our volunteers, but also to provide a forum where people can learn more about topic-specific areas of IHL, but also a place for the purposes of constructive discussion on this body of law, a body of law that affects all of us, just as armed conflict affects all of us, albeit in different ways. Today is the second in our war writing webinar series, where we highlight notable book publications, both fiction and nonfiction, that in some way further the IHL discourse, either by the story told or the academic perspective given. Today, our guest is Dr. Craig Jones, here to discuss his recent book publication, War Lawyers, the United States, Israel, and Juridical Warfare. Dr. Jones is a lecturer in political geography in the School of Geography, Sociology, and Politics at Newcastle University. He completed his PhD in geography at the University of British Columbia in 2017. He researches the geographies of later modern warfare and is especially interested in legal and medical materialities of war and conflict in the contemporary Middle East. As with all our programs, please keep yourself on mute for the entirety of the presentation. If you have questions, please feel free to record them in the chat. We will make sure that they are noted and asked at the end. If for some reason we do not have time to get to your question, Dr. Jones has given us permission to pass these along to his email. Thank you again for attending. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Craig Jones. Sorry about that. Excuse me. Um, thank you, Christian, for the kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Amanda, uh, for having me. And thank you to the American Red Cross for the kind invite. It's uh, really uh, good to be in front of you. Thanks also, everyone, for joining uh, me uh, in what is my evening here in the UK and what is afternoon for you during difficult times during both COVID. And I understand that there's big snowstorms across America and you're experiencing difficulties with power outages so I hope all is well and and thanks to thanks for coming uh, this afternoon so as Christian said uh, I have a new book out it was published in the UK in November and it's just come out uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in the US um, and it's about the involvement of military lawyers who I've called war lawyers in and their involvement in uh, lethal and non-lethal targeting operations and I've prepared some uh, lecture slides here. If anyone would like them, please do email me and I'll, I'll be happy to, to send them over uh, to you uh, personally. So let's just... Sorry, just one second, please. There we go. Okay, so some of you may have seen uh, this film, which is a little vignette that I begin the book with. Uh, this is a screenshot from the film, the British film, Eye in the Sky. Uh, and in the scene uh, and the movie, uh, it is about a fictional drone strike which the British Armed Forces are doing uh, over Kenya. And uh, in a very dramatic scene, uh, the actor Helen Mirren, who is the senior commander in charge of the operation, it's a drone operation, unmanned aerial vehicle operation over the building that you see on the bottom of your screen there. And in a very dramatic version of, uh, of an unmanned aerial vehicle strike, um, a bread seller appears to the bottom of the screen in, circled in blue. And the commander is in a bind as to whether or not she should launch the missile with the so-called terrorists inside, now that this bread seller has appeared uh, in the bottom corner of the picture, uh, a woman 
uh, clearly innocent a civilian. Um, and so the question arises whether or not it's essentially legal to, uh, to, to continue the strike and whether that's legitimate collateral damage. And so in this scene, Helen Mirren turns to her lawyer, Jeff Heffernan, and asks her, him very explicitly, are we clear to engage, yes or no? Come on, make a decision. Now, although that, that transcript actually came from a series of interviews with uh, UK military lawyers, that's a sort of dramatised scene. But I thought I'd begin there because I think whether rhetorically or politically or practically, what it demonstrates is uh, the rising power of military lawyers in targeting operations. The, qu the questions that commanders are asking them increasingly look something like this, yes or no, and, and those sorts of things. So that's essentially what the book is about, at least as a dramatic hook. But really it's about this. It is about the history by which militaries, including the US and Israel, have invited military lawyers or war lawyers into the war room. And back in 2013, I met a uh, well-known Israeli military lawyer, and he described to me this historic process in a particularly uh, dramatic term. He told me that a few years ago, it was unheard of to have a lawyer in the room in the military operation planning meeting. But now they, he was referring specifically to the Israeli military, they can't move without them. So the book is really, a, is really about two things. Firstly, it is about the question of why and how and when. Why, how and when that is, did military lawyers come to be invited into the war room? Why would they be invited into the war room? Why would militaries that have been around for centuries, all of a sudden, historically, relatively speaking, require military lawyers to enter the war room to ask them the sorts of questions about the adjudication of life and death on the battlefield. And then it's also about the consequences when one does that. So what are the consequences of inviting military lawyers into the war room, i.e. what effect do they have on the conduct and outcome of both targeting operations, but war uh, more generally. Just as a little bit of background, and I understand that that this is an audience who engages with these sorts of questions. So I'll, I'll go briefly. If there are questions about any of this, I'd be really happy to take them up in the Q&A afterwards. I'm sure you know that military lawyers in various different guises have been around uh, for centuries. The Judge Advocate General Corps in the US boasts proudly to be the most, uh, the oldest and largest law firm in America. So although military lawyers have been around for a long time, they haven't historically done targeting. They've done all kinds of things except targeting. They've done uh, fiscal law, contract law, uh, procurement of weapons law, divorce law, military justice. They've done everything but this sort of very tip of the spear uh, of late modern war. And then in that changes in 1990, primarily with the invasion of, uh, of Iraq in what became known as the First Gulf War, but also some smaller wars around that time, including the invasion uh, of Panama in 1989. That changes, and for the first time historically, you see uh, military lawyers invited into the war room to adjudicate on these kinds of questions. So that's where the, the history starts in terms of their involvement in 1990. The book actually goes a little bit further back and starts in Vietnam for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But the argument in the book is that although that dates back to 1990 and the uh, earlier precedents, uh, military lawyers really become a key, a key part of the targeting cycle or what the US Air Force themselves refer to as the kill chain uh, in the post 9-11 era. That is especially after the invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Just to demonstrate some sense of newness, because among military lawyers and among the newer generation of people who are military guys and girls who uh, engage in these sorts of questions, uh, it's become so uh, part of what they do that they forget that there was another way of doing it. So I just refer us here to this quote from the Judge Advocate General Journal towards the end or just after the end of the Second World War. I won't read it out in full. But the point of the quote is to demonstrate the fact that 
military lawyers at the time bemoaned the fact that they were not involved in the tip of the spear of modern war, that they were, as the red part of the quote says, far down the line from the man who pulled the trigger. And for them, from the writing at the time, we can gather that that was a source of frustration, a source, a source of, uh, of angst in some ways that they weren't able to contribute as much as they thought themselves capable of contributing. The scope of the book is roughly as follows. Um, I'm interested primarily uh, in the US and Israeli targeting practices uh, in three principal spaces, that is Iraq, Afghanistan, and the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank uh, and Gaza. Uh, I did do some research on the UK, uh, but for various different reasons, that didn't become a key part of the study of the book, partly because of the classification issues in the UK and their unwillingness to participate in a meaningful way uh, in the study sort of prevented me uh, from fully including them. And then, as I've already mentioned, the book starts in Vietnam um, and it starts in Vietnam because particular things happen in Vietnam, including the commission of war crimes, my lay, but also other crimes, which really set the US military in motion uh, to um, uh, get in place what's called the law of war program in which they, for the first time, really institutionalize and put into uh, lots of doctrine uh, what it is that they've learned from Vietnam. And one of the things that they've learned is that the troops had insufficient training in the laws of war. That was in part blamed, uh, uh, the war crimes in part that were committed in my were in part blamed on the fact of that um, lack, of, uh, lack of understanding by the troops on the ground in the laws of war. And thus the law of war program was proposed as a solution uh, to, uh, to both um, serve as a discipline for the troops but also to help the American military fight within the bounds of what it considered uh, the legal uh, warfare moving forward. And so the history begins there, uh, as I say, but, but military lawyers weren't, despite one or two claims in the literature, they weren't involved in day-to-day -day targeting uh, for uh, the Vietnam War, neither the ground wars uh, nor the air wars. Just in terms of a little bit about what I did, and, and, and I'll go briefly here, um, I conducted over 60 interviews with JAGs, military lawyers, uh, and various different operators. Operators here has just taken anyone to, to, that was involved in targeting, be that drone uh, pilots or, or drone, sensed, uh, drone analysts um, and, and intelligence analysts and, and people involved in targeting in one way, shape or form. Uh, there's lots of uh, stuff. One thing that I would never accuse, especially the American military, of being is not prolific uh, at publishing and authoring all kinds of military doctrine, all kinds of presentations, all kinds of uh, materials which are interesting for publics uh, like us, interested for researchers like us, uh, and give us material with which to work and understand what it is that the American military, but also the Israeli military, uh, and other uh, NATO militaries uh, are doing. Uh, and so there's a whole trove of that stuff out there as well as the other side of things, the more ICRC side of things, human rights uh, law, human rights watch reports and those kind of things as well as journalistic accounts. Uh, kept me busy for, for quite some time and in part explained why the book uh, took me so long to research and write. I also did some very brief uh, stints of archival research in Virginia uh, on uh, the Vietnam War and trying to figure out the involvement of day-to-day -day military lawyers uh, on the ground in Vietnam. Happy to talk more about that again in the Q&A. I just want to go really briefly over the key uh, arguments. The book makes two sets of arguments. One may be more interesting to you uh, as a sort of uh, American Red Cross audience than the other. Uh, but there are essentially three, uh, there's, there's two arguments and there's three steps to the first argument. So I'll just uh, say them uh, briefly. And if you've got questions again, we can follow up. So I start with a claim. It might be a contentious one, perhaps for some of us, that the laws of war are in some key senses fundamentally indeterminate, which is to say that different groups of people or epistemic communities disagree, I think, fundamentally uh, about uh, the purpose and weight of elementary principles. And we go that, you know, two obvious examples about 
interpretations of military necessity, interpretations of hostile act, hostile intent, proportionality. I would say that on average, if you surveyed American JAGs versus uh, American ICRC lawyers, you would get very different readings of those key uh, law of war, international humanitarian law uh, principles. So they're indeterminate, or there is at least, we could probably agree some sort of indeterminacy with the laws of war. The American military historically, as of the Vietnam War, I argue, has come to see that determinacy as a resource or a potential opportunity. Um, and uh, my argument in the book is that although we can no longer say that states have the monopoly on that interpretation, as they once did with early treaty law at the turn of the uh, 20th century, perhaps, um, it is still the, the state's interpretation of law that prevails, certainly on the space uh, of the battlefield. Uh, and here I refer to this idea uh, that comes from uh, American military lawyers especially, but which is also spilled over to Israeli military lawyers about this idea of law as a force multiplier. So law is not something only which constrains, although it is and it does and it can do that, it's also something which enables, hence this idea of a, the law being a resource or an opportunity. And then the third part of the claim is that this interpretation or what they call operationalization of the laws of war serve in turn to make law itself. The obvious cases about that are about the evolution of customary international law, although I realize that's complicated and not straightforward. Uh, but I focus on the US and Israel partly because the argument is that they push at the boundaries of international law, be that what I would call the legalization of assassination, which we now call targeted killing, uh, be that certain forms of targeting around hostile intent, be that targeting of certain individuals based on patterns of behavior uh, on, on certain locations, uh, in a way in which makes potential precedents of law. So it's not just that these, these are in one person's interpretation against another, but that the US and Israel as actors and as states that are involved in multiple long-standing wars have some sort of hegemonic uh, uh, reading over uh, those, uh, those interpretations, i.e. one person's interpretation is not just as equal as another's. And so I put this into conversation. This is the last part of the first argument. Uh, and this might perhaps resonate with some of, uh, uh, some of the thoughts and feelings among the American Red Cross, I'm not sure. But there is some sense, at least in the post 9-11 era, with the commission of torture, with uh, Bush's famous uh, uh, circumnavigation of the Geneva Conventions vis-a-vis -vis unlawful combatants and those sorts of things, that, as Jens David Olin argued, that uh, there is an assault uh, on international law, that somehow uh, international law has been under attack, hence Guantanamo, hence Abu Ghraib, and those sorts of places. But my argument is, 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 is similar uh, with, with the addition that that assault, if we take that interpretive power of the law seriously, if we take JAGs and, and war lawyers' interpretations of the law seriously, I argue that um, that assault on the law is also taking place through the medium of law itself, which is to say that the law is in part the problem and not just the solution, as per David uh, uh, Jens Olin's reading in that sort of very liberal sense. Um, and so the second part of the argument, I'll, I'll, this is less sort of legalistic and perhaps therefore uh, a little less interesting to you, but it, it's also a threefold argument and it goes something like this. Uh, later modern war uh, or later modern killing takes place over a vast uh, spatial and temporal uh, terrain, uh, which is a fancy way of saying that uh, when America, for example, conducts a drone strike, in order to conduct that strike, you need uh, several different people in several different places in order to make that strike possible. Uh, and the jobs that people do are heavily dispersed, not just across bases in the Middle East, but they are, of course, in the Middle East, but also uh, at home uh, in the continental United States. So you have drones commonly flown out of Creech, intelligence coming from Shore Air Force Base, uh, the US Air Force based in Alabama, 
uh, um, the whole operation fielded from Qatar, from the uh, operations center, as well as lots of forward uh, operations bases. And when one has such a radically dispersed uh, uh, kill chain or set of actors across space and time, uh, it is very difficult, therefore, to allocate responsibility uh, within that. And there's a whole uh, body of work in social cultural theory that I draw on to, to make uh, this uh, argument, which is the second part. And against the conventional wisdom, military lawyers uh, in, in the conventional terms are brought in to resolve those difficulties, to allocate responsibility, to uh, be there for the commander whose ultimate responsibility it is, uh, to make a decision, to sort of bring legal clarity th through and to the fog of war. But my argument is the contrary. When we invite military lawyers into the room, they remain part of that problem. They remain part of the problem of the allocation or inability to allocate responsibility for act in the kill chain. And you see this most clearly, I think, in the commendable, though problematic, investigations of strikes when they go wrong, which are obviously redacted, but they are often published uh, by different areas of the US military, and one can read that. And the allocation of responsibility, who sees what, where the intelligence comes from, how reliable the intelligence is, whether the military lawyer is in the shower or not, or is available on the other end of the phone, whether the phone line is even working. Those sorts of things, as, as, as um, small or as insignificant as they might sound, re-enter into and are a crucial part of who lives and who dies, uh, I argue, in modern war. So that's really the argument um, set out, the two parts of it. Um, I'm aware that I'm approaching how long I would said I would talk for, so I'll begin to wrap up here. This may or may not be familiar to you, it is just a diagrammatic representation of uh, the targeting cycle. And the book in large part, and certainly the second half of the book, is about that circle. Uh, it is, I mean, it's very disembodied and very diagrammatic, um, but it's what the US military or the US Air Force calls the kill chain, known colloquially also as the donut of death, which is at least a sort of act, uh, accurate description of, of part of what the targeting cycle uh, is all about. And the book is really about the involvement of military lawyers across those multiple phases. I haven't got time to talk about all of those phases, uh, and again, I'm happy to in the Q&A, but suffice it to say from the very idea of going to war to finding and locating targets and thinking about what it is that one needs to strike in a war zone to finding those targets, tracking them uh, and actually targeting them, doing the follow-up assessment of whether that, that strike was successful, whether or not civilian casualties were killed, military lawyers are involved in the whole part of the cycle. And they, I argue, sort of constitute the way that that cycle feels and looks today, i.e. they're a crucial part, um, whether or not they are in the loop of a particular operation, the targeting operations are, in, you know, involubly shaped by the involvement of, of JAGs today. And I have lots of, you know, sort of rich quotes and descriptions of that, that involvement and of that sort of the centrality to uh, outcomes uh, on the battlefield. Just to give you a really quick overview of the whole book, uh, the book, as I mentioned, starts in Vietnam, that's chapter one. It then turns to a the sort of uh, institutional or bureaucratic uh, history by which the US military pivots from uh, understanding some of the illegalities of the Vietnam War and also some of the, the protests against the Vietnam War and, and sort of what went wrong into a sort of lessons learned, legally speaking, uh, to what I call the birth of operational law, which military lawyers are essential to, uh, in which they sort of, not for the first time, because I think for the first time that happened, we can go back to, to Francis Lieber uh, and to the American Civil War, but really institutionally, I argue for the first time, and doctrinally, uh, they, they put, begin to put the laws of war or international humanitarian uh, law to use. And this is where the idea of force multiplier sort of comes in to its own. Um, it's put to use for the first time in chapter three in, in the first Gulf War, as I've mentioned. Uh, and there, there are some very interesting and I argue problematic readings of, of dual use, dual use infrastructure and dual use targeting of infrastructure and specifically the targeting of Iraq's uh, electricity 
uh, grid and infrastructure that had multiple ramifications for civilian populations long after those mere 42 days of aerial uh, warfare. And uh, then I, I turned to Israel and some of the history of, of war lawyering in Israel, which dates back to the inception of the Israeli state uh, and to the occupation of the Palestinian territories, uh, but which, much like the US, really picks up speed in the post 9 11 era, although they have their own sort of different reasons and different histories that are much more closely tied to uh, the second father uh, as of 2000, uh, the second intifada uh, in Palestine and their response to those uh, uprisings. And then the final two chapters, uh, five and six, are a uh, zoom in in, in, in in quite forensic detail into that targeting cycle and look at exactly when and when not military lawyers are involved. Chapter uh, five looks at pre-planned targeting, targeting that, that takes place where targets are known in advance. And then chapter six does the uh, emergent or dynamic targeting where things aren't as known in advance but emerge on the fly and whether or not military lawyers are uh, in the loop. And then the book finishes on a broader consideration of uh, juridical warfare, the reasons why uh, um, uh, military, uh, why, uh, um, why I argue law has war has become uh, more legalized, why militaries have turned to lawyers, why uh, why we fight wars in terms of their legalities these days. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit more about that because I'm drawing here on a, a rich intellectual tradition that goes back some years now, whereby um, both people in the US military as well as critical legal scholars that come at things from a di different perspective, both somehow agree that indeed it was wrong to say that in times of law, the, in times of war, the law uh, falls silent. And David Kennedy has famously argued that war has in many senses become a legal institution. In the book, I detail both the reasons and the consequences for this, and I just want to go briefly over them here. Again, I will send the slides if you need them. Uh, it's partly I'm interested in the particular histories of the military lawyer, and everything I've said so far is a narrow sense of how can we account for the rise of this particular individual. Of course, it's important to put the rise of that particular professional in its proper historical context and to do so in two senses. The first sense in which I try to do that across the book is the various changes that have taken shape in the ways that war is fought and understood across the 20th century. And this is paraphrasing whole bodies of literature here, but there's been a blurring of, of the civilian and combatant distinction. There's been an urbanization of warfare. There has been uh, individuation of warfare where we switch from targeting groups of people to targeting uh, individuals based on behavior rather than status. Uh, there has been, of course, the, uh, changing technological capacities as well as crucially the rise uh, of, of so-called uh, drones and drone warfare. And there has both in the US and Israeli militaries been a rising concern for civilian casualties. Um, although we can sort of agree or disagree about whether that's sufficient. And so there is extrinsic changes in war that have taken place, which in some senses make war lawyers a solution to a problem that militaries have not historically had. And then there are a, seri a series of changes, sorry, beg your pardon, a series of changes that have taken place, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, about uh, international law, which have taken place across the same time period, primarily 20th century, but especially, at, I'd argue, uh, since the uh, Geneva Conventions of 49 and the additional protocols of 77. Um, and so I won't read those out, but this is suffice it to say that the rise of human rights uh, law has had some effect on international humanitarian law. Uh, and uh, the response by that is to sort of take law uh, more seriously uh, to weaponize law, to think about lawfare, as Charles Dunlap uh, famously put it, to, to sort of put law uh, to use as a weapon of law. And, but also things like, you know, the rule of law and, and, and state building and, and state apparatus building that's been part of American warfare for, well, for also going back to at least Vietnam. And so the changes in war, changes in law that make all of this uh, um, more, um, that explain, if you like, the term to the military lawyer. So I just want to end then by saying that what is, 
um, what I've tried to do really in the, in the book, and, and this begins to answer the question of why I set out to write the book, is I was interested in a certain disconnect between what publics, if I can make generalization about publics, and what they understand about international law, the, the potential of international law, potential of international law for restraint, the power of the International Criminal Court, with what happens on the battlefield. And so I was interested in how it is, how can we explain that disconnect between what publics believe that the international law can achieve and what it actually does. And in order to do that, I think we must more carefully look at how it is that militaries, not just the US and, is and Israel, but all militaries and non-state actors, how they interpret um, international law and how it is that they take this big, often ambiguous body of law and make it real on the battlefield, make it concrete, because it's one thing to look at law as textual, it's one thing to make meaning in the classroom, it's quite another thing to put that into practice. And ultimately the book is about what happens when you put law into practice, when the bullets are flying, when the chips are down and when things are real and uh, the result is, is, is chaotic and messy and the result is that I argue, you know, violence can be furthered and extended and sometimes legitimized through law as well as uh, tempered, as well as uh, limited and all those other things that people might wish it to do. And so with that, uh, I will end and, and thank you very much for listening. I really look forward to uh, the questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, for that wonderful presentation um, and for just starting this conversation on a very important topic um, in a way that's not so drenched in legalese for those of us that are in law school. We often uh, read things that are on uh, you know, a level where there's language that's a lot harder to understand uh, for, for other people. Um, and you've made it a lot easier to engage in this dialogue regardless of your academic background. So thank you very much for that. Um, so my first question um, is, you referenced a quote um, in your slides that international law is kind of under attack in the US and is being assaulted. Um, do you think that this employment of international law to wage in one war um, is a violation of international law or is it more of a form of legal opportunism? Basically, you know, given that the purpose of a war is to win it, should states not be interpreting the law in their favor? When does that go too far? Yeah, thank you, Amanda, great question. I think that um, violation and um, interpretation of the law have uh, understudied and, 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 and close and not well understood uh, relationship. So in the book, I quote from a series of very prominent actors, including military lawyers, who, for example, and this is a direct quote, said that international law proceeds through violation. When, when states do things for long enough, they have a habit of becoming law. That was a famous military lawyer called Daniel Reisner, who was referring to uh, his, his hand in, in partly legalizing uh, what, what then was called assassination and, and has since become known as targeted killing. But he was also referring to uh, the Israeli uh, bombing of nuclear reactors in uh, Iraq, which were uh, at the time um, the international community was very much against. Um, but they got used to it. And this is the idea. Um, I mean, although we can say that, you know, torture and those things fortunately didn't become legal, I think that they do set dangerous precedents. I think it's not necessarily how these states do or don't violate the laws of war, although that's important for people to do and people to pursue. For me, it's how those strategic interpretations are used and how they become so powerful and prevalent that they can be used to not circumnavigate in a cynical sense, but to show interpretations which, which are seen to not violate. And, and those are more powerful than, a, than a, you're better off showing how you, how you have a divergent interpretation of international law than simply violating it, because 
showing you have an, uh, an interpretation of it is will give you legitimacy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my next question um, is about the, the rise of war lawyers beginning in the 1990s. Why was there kind of a rise in the use of war lawyers? Um, and um, what have those war lawyers uh, contributed to political cultural shifts um, that are um, being undergone in the way that war is being fought and understood today? Yeah, thank you. So um, in terms of the of the why, I hope I've you know started to answer that question, although it's a uh, you know a long historical one. Um, and I think the ultimate answer is um, the one thing I didn't say is that across the late 20th century, partly um, in places like Kosovo, but certainly also places like Iraq, um, battlefields become incredibly complicated spaces, especially as war enters cities, uh, um, be that Sarajevo, be that Baghdad um, and other places. Uh, and militaries are in a bind as to sort of what to do about that. At the same time, you have the rise of global human rights coming slightly earlier in the 1970s. You have people uh, and organizations like Human Rights Watch, which come on the scene, which begin interpreting what militaries are doing, especially what the American military is doing, and then making accusations of criminality and war crimes. And so the militaries find themselves in a bind uh, in this, you know, I mean, the military sees everything as, as a potential sphere of war. And so law, negative press, uh, you know, anything negative in, in any media or accusations of criminality really hurt the war effort. They're bad for public support back home. That was the whole lesson of Vietnam. And so they're in a bind and military lawyers are a, become a solution. They have put themselves in the right place partly out of the, the, the sort of, if you like, boring work that they did in the 70s and 80s, the bureaucratic inside work about putting themselves, you know, making themselves useful for commanders. And by the way, military commanders were once very, very, very skeptical of having lawyers anywhere near them when it comes to actual war fighting. It was fine if they wanted to help them out with taxes or fine if they wanted to help them out with, um, you know, things like divorce law. Uh, or, or getting their bills in order back home if they couldn't pay them if they were deployed. But when it came to, you know, interfering in the actual day-to-day -day war, they weren't pleased. So military lawyers convinced them that they were useful, that they could help them, that they weren't there to hinder them, that law could be a force multiplier. And so, you know, precisely at that time when war becomes complicated, uh, when you have human rights on the other side, uh, you get this... Uh, these military lawyers in the right place at the right time uh, and they do prove themselves very useful i mean in, in the first time they were used in iraq in 1990 they were deployed in the hundreds um, out to various places in the middle east including to saudi arabia and um you know they i interviewed i wouldn't say everyone but more or less everyone involved in terms of the war fighters themselves who conducted the air war and they said you know if they were going to take one single member of staff out with them out there, they would be taking their lawyers, which you know really proves how much they they were useful. And if military lawyers got in the way of what they were doing, they wouldn't be saying things like that. Okay, great, thank you so much. I think uh, I'll stop with my questions for now. I could go on for quite a long time based off of what I've read from your book so far, um, but I'm uh, alerted to the fact that many other people have some questions for you. Um, so uh, one of the questions we just got in the chat was, uh, Dr. Jones, can you address the legal implications of a demographic shift of operators present in the war theater, particularly from the Middle East, being shifted from enlisted soldiers to private defense contractors, AKA civilians that aren't military members? Uh, is the behavior of these private contractors under the same legal scrutiny that our military members would be? Thank you. Yeah, really great question. Thank you for that. Um, I can speak to it. Um, I can't speak to it in depth. I can only say that, uh, I, and I think where perhaps you're getting at here is there's obviously a, um, a, a huge turn to, um, or if you like, an outsourcing of much war fighting. And certainly the US has, has led the way 
uh, in doing that, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are lots of famous books on this, both good and bad, about people like Blackwater, about Halliburton and those various companies involved. I never came across anything specific in my research about military lawyers giving advice to those military contractors. From the one or two cases that I have studied in depth, which include the um, infamous 2007 uh, shoot up, I don't know what else to call it, um, in the center of Baghdad, whereby Blackwater uh, operators opened fire on uh, a series of Iraqi civilians and committed, uh, and, 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 and committed you know, what has been widely understood as, as, as crimes, if not war crimes. Um, they had no legal advisors in the loop. Uh, they didn't need to have legal advisors in the loop. And they appealed to an exception in the law, which, um, you know, they're not under the same uniform code of military justice that all uh, US armed forces are under. And therefore, they're not literally under the same legal uh, um, uh, uh, apparatus. And so when things go wrong, they are under contractual trouble i.e., you know, it's thinking about payments, uh, it's thinking about contracts as opposed to any disciplinary hearings. And that's really crucial because the Uniform Code of Military Justice is the central way in which everything from misdemeanors to, you know, theft to, to little malpractice out in the field that we could easily forgive to serious war crimes uh, in the American military are dealt with. And so in some senses, you know, that's a real gap in the book because lots of this stuff is happening via, as, as the question suggests, via these military contractors, and yet they fall outside of this apparatus of, of military legal advice. So um, I'm not sure who asked, who asked the question if you're doing research, but if, if, if you are doing research, that would be a great topic to engage more on. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing some responses to that question as well in the chat, so awesome. All right, so we actually have a question from someone who would like to ask directly. Um, so Dennis, would you like to unmute and ask your question now? Uh, sure thing, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. I look forward to, uh, to reading your book. It, it seemed to me that most of your focus was on Army and Air Force. Uh, I do know that there were a limited number of Navy lawyers involved in operational law Law of the Sea, Law of Armed Conflict, Targeting, Naval Warfare, Visit and Search, uh, during Vietnam and earlier, particularly uh, at the uh, numbered fleet level, 6th and 7th, uh, Pacific Fleet, Four-Star Commander, Pacific Command, another Four-Star Commander. But there were no lawyers at subordinate commands, even aircraft carrier battle groups. So one reason lawyers wouldn't be involved in targeting is they weren't there, except at very high levels uh, in the Navy. And I know Navy lawyers got involved in operational law earlier than Army and Air Force. I do recall back in the late 80s, the chief of staff of the Army actually ordering subordinate commanders to let lawyers into command centers and give them the clearance because previously they didn't have a security clearance to allow them even be in a command center. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's certainly lawyers all over the place on the battlefield now, and that's changed for a variety of, of reasons. But uh, I was just sort of curious, did your research involve uh, uh, the Navy at all, or was it primarily Air Force and Army history? Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, great question, and thanks for that history. I didn't catch it all, but I'd be, you know, um, perhaps Christian can put us in touch, uh, or Amanda. I, I would love to chat more. It's clear that you, you know a lot about this, and especially the Navy experience. I should have made clearer from the start, my apologies. Uh, this is ultimately about aerial targeting operations. And the reason why I speak sometimes also about the army is, is because as you know, better than, better than me certainly is that the sort of close cooperation between air force and ground force operations, especially as they exist with close air support and, and troops in contact scenarios. And so I was really only interested uh, you know, wrongly in some ways in the air force, but the air force led me inevitably to uh, to the uh, to the army as well. So the Navy are a big emission. I mean, I did talk to one or two uh, Navy um, JAGs uh, based in Charlottesville um, uh, uh, and they were, you know, there's one or two sort of news story accounts about what they what they have done. Uh, but but primarily, you know, I'm interested in air operations. And so it's interesting to hear um, 
you know, that, that different Navy perspective, especially as their earlier involvement, I'd be, you know, perhaps as a sort of corrective to the, to the new forward, if, should the book be rewritten, um, you know, that might be a, a nice side uh, story to that history. But I'd be very interested in speaking. Um, but yeah, apologies, I should have made clear. It's, it's really about aerial targeting operations. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Dennis. Um, our next question, um, where in the kill chain can you find the majority of legal ambiguities and debatably illegal activities taking place? Is it rampant in a particular step or is it spread fairly even across the board, would you say? Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, just, to, just to make clear, I, I would say that I wouldn't call them uh, illegalities in the kill chain. And um, you know, if I did, then I'm sure that Dennis and others on the call would, uh, would, would jump on top of me. Um, I think it's, it's careful that I, you know, um, as critical as I am of the work that they do, I don't think that there is uh, any ill intent and I don't think there is a sort of any deliberate um, commission of or, or even working towards crimes and criminality and, and JAGs are there to sort of cover them up. I really think that that's a misreading and, and, uh, and not what they do. Um, I would say, and that, but that's, so that's, I just wanted to sort of say that, you know, outright. Um, I would say, however, that there is lots of constructive ambiguity in the kill chain. I mean, the kill chain is a vastly complicated thing, um, bureaucratically, uh, ge geographically, uh, and, and, you know, across, across time as well. And even having written a book, which is ultimately about the kill chain, I couldn't pretend to you to understand its full machinations, its full varieties because of its complexity. And one kill chain that's taking place, let's say over the skies of Syria right now, is not the same kill chain as was taking place during the peak of ISIS fighting, uh, the fight against ISIS in, in Raqqa or Mosul, you know, just a few years ago. So it, it's very different. It's very context specific. Different individuals are involved at different points. Um, you know, JAGs do rotations of six and 12 months. So it's different people uh, involved. Uh, and so it's a complicated thing. And it is a, um, it is something where, where military lawyers come in and, and do their best, but yet mistakes happen, things go wrong, civilians die, there's fratricide cases, weapons misfire, um, all of that stuff happens. And my argument is, you know, I don't want to put this on the jacks. I don't think, you know, it's, it's not about blaming anyone, it's not about anyone's fault anyway. But if, if, if we were interested in pursuing those kind of questions, my argument would be, that the whole apparatus of, of the kill chain by which the JAGs, the operators, the drones, the technologies, every, the civilian contractors, the whole institute is, is, this, is this big bumbling thing, it goes wrong uh, and you know, people die and ultimately a kill chain is about killing people. Uh, it's not, you know, a kill chain won't save lives. It's designed to kill. It's designed to kill in, in more ethical ways or more legal ways. Um, but military, you know, where can you find most of them? You know, as, as Dennis just mentioned, they're, they're everywhere. I mean, geographically, they're everywhere. So I spoke to, you know, they're, they're based all over the United States. They have training schools in, in, in Charlottesville and Virginia. They, uh, they accompany, they have them at Shore Air Force Base. So I spoke to one guy, a very, very, very senior commander who was responsible for fighting the air wars, for giving the intelligence to, uh, to, uh, to the guys out in, in Qatar who were flying missions over uh, Iraq and Syria. And he just couldn't get his targets through. There was a, such a threshold of caution that he couldn't get any of his target intelligence improved. So he called a military lawyer in to help him. That was at Shore Air Force Base. So they're there. There's three or four of them stationed out in Qatar. So they're at various different places, but at any one time, you know, everything I've just said was true two years ago when I found the information out. It might not be true right now. That jag from Shore Air Force Base might have been pulled out. So just like if you imagine any institute that you might be part of where you work, it's the same, you know, things change, different processes come in, some courses are canceled, some things, have, you know, training is different. So it's, 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I might seem all over the place, but in a way I'm deliberately doing that because it reflects accurately the complexity of both warfare and the, and the kill chain as it takes place. Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, our next question from the chat is about uh, the use of electronics. Um, so of course, over the past few decades, we've seen a, a huge spike in, in the use of electronics and they're getting smaller, they're easier to, to bring around with you. So uh, they asked, could you please address the impact of increased personal electronics, such as smartphones, um, on how these sorts of decisions are made? Um, can it be said at all to heighten focus on vulnerable populations? Um, is this something that you found as part of your research? Yeah, thank you. Great question, really thoughtful. <laughs> My funny answer to your question was it would be that if you're doing anything bad, I hope you don't have a mobile phone with you. Um, because, you know, we know not just after the sort of several revelations about Google and Facebook, but, but by the key revelations of, of Edward Snowden, that all of these things are tracked. And that's, that's both true for, you know, US domestic populations, uh, as it is for, for um, enemies and indeed non-enemies, uh, you know, across uh, the various battlefields. One thing I would say that gives you a sort of concrete case and is, is not being facetious as I was just being, uh, would be to say that for a long period, and I'm sure it's still the case, uh, the US Air Force in particular got into quite some bother with this idea of tracking SIM cards. This is, you know, you can read about this. Uh, I have some great sources on this that do a forensic, there was some New York Times reporting about it as well, that do a forensic account of this. And they were tracking um, signals, in what they call signals intelligence. Uh, that is the hoovering up information about mobile phones and then interactions of mobile phones with other mobile phones. Often, you know, would be or so-called terrorists were changing SIM cards, which were giving their phones or were disbanding them. And the American US Air Force was following those SIM cards in space and in time and targeting not the person, but the SIM card, because those uh, SIM cards were giving certain forms of intelligence that they deemed suspicious. And it became a whole realm, a whole way uh, of doing targeting. Um, um, I'm forgetting the name right now, but it has its own name and that became a sort of area of specialization. Now folks in the, in the army who are more interested in sort of what they call realities on the ground will tell you that although the American Air Force like to say that they can see everything from above with their drones and their fancy technologies, you know, people like, William, famous people like William Arkin, a, a, a famous former army guy who commentates on some of this stuff, he'll say that, you know, you can, you can track all those technologies as you want, but what you need is human intelligence. You need eyes on the ground verifying this stuff. And if you don't have that, you're essentially going to be, you know, chasing the wrong people. And for some of these cases, again, all documented and exposed by, by quality journalists and academics, you have um, attempts to go after a single terrorist ending up taking 50, up to 50 strikes in order to kill that person because of all these misfires of intelligence, which are based partly because of, you know, of these SIM cards and, and different electronic signals, which have ended up in the wrong place that have give them, if you like, misinformation. Uh, and and that, that is a massive, massive risk exposure. And thank you for mentioning the sort of especially vulnerable populations, because, you know, um, I'm suspicious of all this stuff and, and believe that we're all trapped. Uh, but, yeah. you know, I don't believe it for a minute, the American military or the, <laughs> or the UK military is interested in blowing me up. Um, and the same can't be said for the various populations in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, uh, where we're involved in. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so I know we're running short on time, but we got quite an interesting question in the chat. Um, it is, what do you see as possible mitigation measures with IHL and the use of drones? It seems that the threshold for legitimate targets is very low and subjective to the trigger operator thousands of miles away. And we can also put you in contact with this person via email for a longer discussion if you'd like. Yes, great, thank you. Thank you, Diego, for the question. Uh, I, there are several and many ways in which um, civilian casualties, civilian casualties uh, can be mitigated. The US Air Force, I think, has a very admirable um, 
not an admirable track record, but an admirable bureaucratic procedure called the CDEM, Collateral Damage Estimation Methodology, in which it sort of carefully maps out using science, using mathematical modeling, physical physics modeling, architectural modeling of building, in which they try to map out what happens if they conduct a strike on a particular target, how can they mitigate those effects? So everything, it runs the gamut from not launching the strike to waiting until they have intelligence that certain people have left the building or that the building is uninhabited or that only the terrorist is at home to uh, firing the missile on a certain trajectory from a certain angle to loading the missile with a delayed fuse so it blows up on the top floor rather than the bottom floor you know doing all of this very technical stuff uh, and they do do those things i don't think there is an interest for anyone in, in the us air force in killing civilians partly because of the ethical dimension, but, but mostly I think because it's counterproductive to, to mission success. Uh, and there's all kinds of mechanisms which are put in place. The most severe mechanisms were put in place by uh, President Obama, which was called a non-combatant cutoff value of zero, which is to say that if the American military wanted to target someone and they knew that there was at least one civilian or they thought there might be one civilian killed, then that strike would be called off. So they do do this stuff. The problem is, as I've sort of already said, things go wrong. The American military doesn't know everything. It can't know everything. It doesn't even understand the culture. It can't always speak the language. It misinterprets all the information. So things go wrong, or not by design, not on purpose, but by design in as much as the complexity is too much for the machine, too much for the killing machine. Uh, and so there are these thresholds. America, you know, I had a, had a slide which we didn't get time to get to, so we can, we can talk about that perhaps privately. Um, but America tries to measure this stuff as much as possible in this scary number. If you've got time, just quickly Google it, NCV or non-combatant cutoff value. You spend two hours bewildering at the state of the world when you realize that the American military tries to put into numbers how many civilians it can kill as a result of a strike. So take a look at that. And if, you, if that's not enough, then get in touch. All right, thank you. And then uh, one final question before we wrap up. Um, so hopefully everyone here uh, attending the lecture has an interest on the top of, of IHL, um, but somebody asked, um, from your research and your talks promoting this book, are you seeing a general interest or a thirst for knowledge from the public on the topic of IHL that they want to learn about this? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know what, if the book was cheaper, I think I'd be seeing a lot more interest uh, for, for anyone who's Googled it. I, I can only apologize at the expense of it. Uh, it's totally out of my hands. It's Oxford University Press and that's academic publishing for you. Uh, and by the way, my royalties are very, very, very small. So the money goes to them and not me. Um, but I would say, yeah, generally, you know, for the last several years in preparing for this stuff, I've done a bit of radio, a tiny bit of TV. Anytime I talk about it, I mean, obviously I'm into it, it's my topic, but yeah, from, you know, being my parents and family to friends, to people who I meet in Israel, people I meet in the US, uh, all over the Middle East are really interested in this stuff, uh, especially interested in the stuff that military lawyers do, but generally speaking, international law, what can it do? What are its sort of, um, you know, uh, potentials? What are its pitfalls? What should, should we be avoiding? things about human shield should we be skeptical when things are called human shield or what's happening there's a real 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 public appetite for this sort of stuff i think uh, which is exciting um but as an academic you know we're not always well placed to to be disseminating that stuff uh and you know we speak everyone speaks different languages uh, i mean often literally but you know different <laughs> different jargon type languages and I, and I try my best as i can to get away from that stuff but I think there's a there's an interest out there and it's you know organizations like the, the american red cross that it sounds like that has that public education program i mean there needs to be more of it i think we should all be you know it should be like civic training in international humanitarian laws knowing how rights and responsibilities like we you know like taking a driving test or something but um yeah i think that i think that there's interest and uh, i'm hoping to you know try and try and get the word out as much as i can not just about my book of course but uh, but about the issues more broadly um, Dr. Jones, could you repeat real quick the um, acronym that you could Google? What was it? NC? Yes, NCV, non combatant cutoff value, NCV. Okay. Great. 
had somebody yeah. asking about that. All right. Well, we used every bit of the hour and a little bit more. Sorry for keeping uh, you guys a little bit longer than anticipated today, but uh, I think that shows that there's a lot of uh, interest in this topic. And thank you so much again, Dr. Jones, uh, for coming in and uh, sparking this discussion today. And thank you for all of our attendants for tuning in. Um, the American Red Cross IHL program will be hosting future webinars in the upcoming weeks, uh, so please go to www.rulesofwar.org slash webinars for more info. Um, and if you have questions or would like access to the recording, please contact the email that has been placed in the chat. Um, and again, uh, Dr. Jones's book is called The War Lawyers, uh, The United States, Israel, and Juridical Warfare. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you.